Hello and welcome to the Urban Orthodox. I have a wonderful, wonderful guest here. I'm so glad to be sitting with this gentleman uh, over over call, over a video call, and and bringing him in um, to the Urban Orthodox channel. Um, and uh, he's a priest in the local area here in the Northeast. Um, he go, his name is Father John Ivanov. He is a local parish priest at St. John the Theologian in Long Island, New York. He originally grew up in the uh, uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, in, in the in the near in the in the distant past, <laughs> no, I'm joking. He was a graduate Very of distant Saint, past. <laughs> <laughs> graduate of Saint Vladimir's Theological Seminary. Um, he has been involved with apologetics and 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 sometimes in the field of urban apologetics as well. Um, he has spent the last thirty years in ministry. Um, specifically 30 years as a deacon, uh, uh, being ordained a deacon at 29 as a priest. Father John is married with 30, excuse me, been married 35 years and has two kids. Please, the Urban Orthodox community, please welcome Father John Ivanov. Thank you again, Father. Anything you have to say to introduce yourself? Micah, thank you very much for that introduction. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor being here this evening with you and with your listeners, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yes, well, well, thank you again. Um, but may may God be glorified. Um, first, just to come, so sometimes a, a part of the introduction I love to get into is just to see how you came into the faith. Um, I think you and I spoke earlier. Um, by chance, were you a convert or a cradle into the Orthodox faith? Um, for anybody watching, that's a good question, and my answer depends on who I'm talking to. Okay. Uh, I, I was okay. born into the faith, you know, so people could say, well, that means you're, you're cradle. Um, it could mean that. When right. I was a, a rebellious teenager, I um, was not, um, I, I felt called by God, but I, I didn't feel that call um, in the very ethnic foreign language church that I grew up in. And uh, so I left for a while uh, because there was a very good Presbyterian church two blocks away from where I lived, had a good youth program, and um, I went there and uh, because a lot of my friends from high school were also going there. And I have to say, I really learned my Bible there. And, and that um, that started me on uh, on really a love affair with the scriptures and uh, knowing them and being able to use them um, appropriately, adequately in uh, giving an account for the hope that was that is within us as, as the scriptures do teach us. And uh, strangely, it was um, my time there that brought me full swing back into orthodoxy. I was at a, uh, we were on a retreat in Del Mar, California. I'll never forget the weekend uh, in uh, June, July of uh, 1972, I believe. And I asked the question of our youth director at the time, what happened to the church after the apostles died? We were studying the book of the Acts of the Holy Apostles. And he said, oh, I'll never forget his answer. Uh, it just fell apart. Mm. And that got me thinking and it got me reading and one book leads to another and pretty soon i began to discover that the 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 faith that i was kind of frustrated with the orthodox faith was the faith of the apostles and i soon found english language orthodox churches in los angeles and um uh, the rest they say is history yes um one good quote i've heard is that sometimes the things that we're frustrated and, and uh, think are lacking is some things that god put, has put on our heart to be and obviously in the field of apologetics you have felt like that for yourself um and obviously uh it sounds like you you had a good transition into the faith in and out so to speak um obviously as a somebody in in in, in the uh, excuse me the orthodox field or excuse me the orthodox faith um and somebody involved with apologetics. How did you get involved in apologetics? What made you look into that specifically? Obviously, with your story, it seems like it leads into it a little bit, but just give us a brief, brief backstory. Well, it, it does. And when I was in, in <coughs> college, I was in Campus Crusade for Christ for a little bit. I was in InterVarsity for a little bit. This is back around the 1975, 1977, 78 period. Um, and I, I realized that there were a lot of, <clears throat> first of all, there were a lot of things that as an Orthodox Christian, I was coming back to it at that time, that a lot of questions were being asked of me and I couldn't quite answer them, <clears throat> but I knew that Orthodoxy 
had answers. I just needed to find out what they were. On the other hand, I noticed uh, that a lot of people on, that they were non-Orthodox, let's say, whatever they were, how can I say this, were quite unfair and quite unkind when they would engage me in uh, in um, a discussion, shall we call it, or, or, or debate, and uh, would sometimes outright twist the scriptures. And I knew what they were saying was wrong, and I would point out to them how I felt it was wrong. Oh, it doesn't matter, you know. You can't be in what you are, or whatever the, the argument happened to be. And I, I just realized that they're not making a, a, they're not making me an ally in any way, shape, or form by treating me the way they were. And so I began to to wonder and to question and to look into a way in which the faith could be presented in such a way that people could understand it, agree with it, <coughs> or even if they disagreed with it, could at least understand our position with it and why we believe the way we believe and so forth. I also <coughs> realized at the time, back in the 70s and even into the 80s, there weren't a lot of there weren't not, there weren't a lot of good uh, of uh, good apologetics books for the Orthodox. There were no apologetics books for the Orthodox. There were very, there was very little that was out there that could help one explain the faith, and sure. many priests were were unprepared to do so. Doesn't mean they couldn't. It means they weren't taught how to. And I began to realize that our clergy wasn't taught how to do apologetics. And that got me interested in it. Wow. Wow. You mentioned uh, a lot of the movements there in California. Were you uh, were, were, were some of the people from those groups? Um, obviously, there was a huge movement that came to the Orthodox faith in California in those the 70s, and 80s. Um, were some of the groups that came up uh, and challenged their faith um, in some of those movements? And were some of the people you found um, a part of the movements that were coming to the faith? I mean, who were you encountering at the time? Well, I, I did encounter the Evangelical Orthodox Church uh, as far back as 1980, and I'll okay. never forget sitting next to Father Richard or Bishop Richard Ballou at the time, who was one of the original seven founders of of that uh, the movement. Um, I'll never forget sitting next to him at a um, at a banquet, and he yeah. was telling me about this this new powerful thing that we've discovered, brother. We've discovered this new powerful thing, the sign of the cross. Oh, my brother, is it powerful? I know he was so excited about <laughs> something they had literally just discovered. And I'm thinking yeah. to myself, oh, Bishop, good. We've known about that for 2000 years. I'm glad you're finally coming on board. Yeah. But it was really <laughs> wonderful to see him and, and the whole EOC uh, literally like like little children with wonderment at Christmas, you know, discovering that ancient apostolic faith and its truth and its beauty and so forth. Those guys were great. The the people that I found really hard to deal with were people from like, for example, um, a Vineyard Christian really hadn't started up yet, but but Calvary Chapel had. I mean, I met Chuck Smith way back in the early 80s, a, a brief encounter, but um, nevertheless, when he... Uh, uh, like many other pastors of his kind, when they discovered I was Orthodox and, oh, we'll have a talk. I'll show you why you need to become one of us. You know, it was just sort of an arrogance on their part of assuming that the Orthodox were always wrong, they were always right, and they were going to show you how. Sure. Yeah. Well, Father, I, I, in a way, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm also glad and in some ways you have those experiences because obviously we're here today and you're a uh, force in the field in in, in in orthodox apologetics and we're and we're thankful for you um, uh, Micah I'm glad I had those experiences yeah. as, as frustrating sometimes as they could be and as 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 mad and angry sometimes as I got I realized that I wasn't prepared to talk with them and I had to get prepared somehow right right is that that's room day 28 for all things work together for the for the glory of God right so day 28 uh, favorite verse of mine you know, so it, 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 it's a blessing those things happen, Father. We're, we're, we're thankful. Um, and in that, you, you're able to come back with, with such love uh, um, for the people because you, you were at, the po at that point with them. Um, and now you're, you're fully in the faith and been there for many years. So glory to God for those times. Glory to God. Uh, uh, I don't know about being that happy with them. Sometimes I wanted to rip their head off. But uh, yeah, I could see that, I could see that there, was, there was some ignorance there on their part as much as there was ignorance on my part. I had stuff to learn. They had stuff to learn. 
And uh, they were more than willing to and, and able to share it with me. I realized I was not, I was willing, but not as able and not as prepared to share with them. And that's where I think apologetics in this day and age really has to become something that, that our clergy and our lay people need to study more, how to give an account, how to give an answer for that hope that, was, that is within us. And that account does vary from who, depending on who you talk to and what tradition they come from. Right. Right. Well, anybody out there listening, I want to uh, encourage you to to see that Father Father John Ivanov, um, as he's talking about his struggles with the faith and it, it blossomed into him discovering the faith more truly. Um, the same thing for me as a, a convert myself, someone uh, who came from another church, um, when I had questions about the faith, um, it, 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 it encouraged me to actually deep dive more deeply. So uh, henceforth, the, the birth of the channel. So uh, we, we are very blessed by the challenges and those things have brought us into the Orthodox faith. One of the questions, Father, if we can transition, that you get a lot of the time um, to getting more meat of the discussion, um, <clears throat> is what happened after the last apostle? Um, sometimes uh, in, in, in certain non-Orthodox circles, um, you, you kind of have this gap, so to speak. Uh, 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 many different groups deal with it differently. Um, but first, Father, if you could uh, bring up some biblical examples from the Bible, um, you know, this, uh, excuse me, descendants, disciples of Paul, um, the apostles, um, you know, Timothy, Titus, uh, some of some of these characters. Can you bring out those stories for us and 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 an angle for us that the Orthodox? Um, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And and I think this question um, is, is really coming to the heart of a lot of um, orthodox, non-orthodox dialogue lately. Yeah. For years, I've, I've seen this happening. And it's really very interesting. And for, for us orthodox, it kind of, the way I see it and the way I present it, it kind of evolves this way. We read how St. Paul, who we could call a first-generation Christian, okay? We right. can call a first-generation Christian. We see how he said to Timothy in one of his epistles, Timothy, my son, what I have taught to you. Okay, now Timothy represents kind of a second generation Christian. Paul clearly evangelized him, catechized him, laid his hands on him and elevated him to a position of authority within the church of, uh, there in Ephesus. Right. So he says, what I've taught to you, teach to other men, so that they can teach other men. Okay, so now what I would say is that shows a an apostolic transmission of, of uh, information and knowledge and, and the life of the church and the gospel and things like that. So you have a first generation Christian telling a second generation Christian. Why do I say second generation? Because he was evangelized and catechized later and because he was young. Paul was much, much older, referred to himself as a father to Timothy. And Timothy was very young. In fact, Paul even said to him, don't, don't let anybody, you know, uh, uh, embarrass you or shame you for being young, you know. Right. So Timothy's like a second generation. So he's going to be teaching others so that when Paul passes from the scene, what he's taught Timothy can then be passed on to the next generation and then to the next after that. Now, that, that's how we Orthodox see it. Others might not see it that way, but that's how we see it, because that's how it played out in history. Because right. it's not just the scriptures that say it. There is verifiable information that exists from non-biblical sources that talks about the life of the church. Now, without getting into that for now, I then tell people when I tell this story, you know, St. Paul talking to Timothy and passing this on and so forth. Wouldn't it be really neat if we could find out exactly what Paul told Timothy that he told others so uh -huh. that they could tell others? Wouldn't it be neat, Mr. Right. and Mrs. Calvinist or Mr. and Mrs. You know, Evangelical, wouldn't it be neat if we could know what he taught them? And sometimes, if I present that information well they'll go yeah that really would be interesting wouldn't you like to be able to read those things those letters and those instructions if they existed yeah we would really like to read those things apostolic fathers right there apostolic fathers well who are those guys well these are men 
some of whom are named in the epistles themselves, like Clement in Rome, for example. These are men who are named in some of the epistles or who clearly from tradition and from extra biblical teachings we know were the disciples of the disciples of the apostles or something like that. We know that Polycarp learned, uh, you know, uh, not not even a generation removed from St. John. We know that Clement learned from, from Paul himself. We know that Ignatius sat on the knee of Jesus when Jesus talked about suffer the little children and forbid them not. So we, we're talking about men who, in some cases, were eyewitnesses along with the apostles themselves. Remember, as I try to tell Mr. and Mrs. Evangelical or whoever, it's not just the 12 that were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Jesus appeared to 500 men, 500 right. people. I shouldn't say men, 500 others. And then at the at, in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, there were about uh, 131, 132 people there, something like that. So <clears throat> it's not just the 12 that saw him. And mm -hmm. it's not just the 12 who were witnesses to his, his resurrection. Paul never was, but says he was in, in uh, by virtue of his apostleship. You know, yeah. that he had seen the risen Lord. So many of these men, and when there are some very good timelines that have been established that lay out on a timeline, okay, here's where, you know, here's the, the here's Pentecost, and here's where Peter and Paul lived, and here's where Timothy lived. And, you know, you start going out like that. Of course, John lived a long time. Right, right. And when you look where Clement and Ignatius and some of those guys, when you look at when they lived, it overlaps. Mm -hmm. It clearly overlaps. Mm -hmm. And Clement, the earliest of the Apostolic Fathers, wrote in the 90s, John was still alive at that time. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, Ignatius, like I said, I mean, we're talking about one who was only two or three, uh, not even generations, we can't say really generations, but uh, was so close in the apostolic seat to the apostles uh, that, that you know, he, he talks about knowing them and things like that. So you've got this overlap of people mm -hmm. who were either eyewitnesses or who were disciples of the disciples or whoever, and they wrote what they were taught by the disciples and the apostles themselves. They wrote down what they knew. Okay. And so what they write when you look at what they write, and there's not just one or two of them, there's a half a dozen or more called the Apostolic Fathers. What they wrote in terms of the monarchial episcopate, in terms of Holy Communion being truly seen as the body and blood of the Lord, in terms of uh, uh, immersive baptism, uh, or whatever they taught about, you see that we still do that today. Uh, right. Mr. and Mrs. Evangelical or Mr. and Mrs. Calvinist, do you still do those things today? And and it's hard for them to grasp this because they've never been taught it. They've never been shown it. They've never learned about it. They know nothing about it. And it's it's if it's not my if they don't disregard it and and reject it outright, their mind is blown if they're willing to consider it, because yeah. it's a very different experience than what they know. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> you. You and I spoke prior to this, and 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 as a convert myself, oh yeah, take your time, Father. Um, uh -oh. my, I'm sorry. No Go problem. Ahead. And so, so I uh, myself, I, I felt almost robbed. I think I used that word with you when I learned about some of these early fathers and early church uh, historians, theologians, and and the people who passed on the faith because you're just not taught about it. And, and if you are, if you do dive in and really studious, um, you kind of have to um, cherry pick, so to speak, um, to fit what you have today. Um, and, 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 and there's just some ways there's a disservice done to the early fathers. Um, out of those early fathers and, and even some of the uh, apostles, can you tell us where they went? Obviously, you know, Thomas, Phillips connection uh, uh, and some of these where their churches were established. I think there's this even they, they might be able to go find the early father, the writings um, or, you know, somebody like uh, Clement. Where, where did uh, uh, Polycarp, where do these people go? What church did they establish? Sure. Can yeah. you give us a little bit of insight there? The second generation, if so to speak. Sure. Yeah, the, the, the actually the third and fourth generation. Uh, we know Clement was in Rome. We know uh -huh. Timothy <clears throat> was in, in <clears throat> Ephesus, Titus was in, in Crete. 
Mm-hmm. You know that Polycarp was also in the the Ephesian area. Ignatius was in Antioch. Um, <clears throat> we know that that Mark, John Mark, uh, went with Peter uh, after Peter's uh, death. Went to Alexandria and founded the church there. Uh-huh. And, and I don't mean, by the way, to say found the church in Africa. He founded the church in Alexandria. Uh, mm-hmm. Matthew had already been down to Ethiopia. The Ethiopian eunuch had already been down to Ethiopia. Uh, so the gospel was already in Africa. It was already Bible in the Middle up. East. It was already, you know, it, it's just amazing how quickly it spread. Right. And how quickly it spread from the hands of the, the third and fourth generation. <clears throat> right. Right. So so after after these fathers, what are, what are we left with um, in, in terms of uh, passing it on? What do you want to elaborate a little bit more? Please do. Sure. What else um, did they they when, give when to? We're us? talking to the non-orthodox, and we're trying to explain and share this information. Um, a lot of times they'll say, "Well, we don't need all that history. We don't need all that. I, I have my Bible. I'm fine." Well, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the Bible is not just fine. It, it's not just the written word as exalted and as as primatial as it is. Even Saint Paul says in that written word. Uh, in the to the Thessalonians, what you have heard by yeah. word or by letter, <clears throat> in other words, what you've read in my epistles, or if you've heard me preach, yeah. stick to it, follow it, you know. And so we have the 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 clear understanding that um, it, it's not like the gospel writers one by one wrote their gospels and passed theirs on to the next, you know, Matthew wrote it and passed it on to Mark and Mark said, well, no, I have my own. I'm going to write one. And, and then Luke said, no, I'm going to write one too. And then they passed it on to St. Paul and he wrote his stuff and it was all passed on linearly at the same time. It All that stuff was not accessed and read until decades after our Lord's death and resurrection and ascension. So what mm. happened in all those decades before there was a written New Testament? There was the oral teaching of the apostles. And it's very clear that it's oral, and it's very clear it was influenced by biblical sources that we do not have today. Because in the epistle of Jude, it talks about something that you only find written in the ascension of Moses. Uh, You find quotes from other uh, biblical sources that are not in the Bible we have today, for example. You have St. Paul in one of his visits, reminding the people, uh, I believe in Ephesus when he was leaving, uh, to remember the words of the Lord, how he said, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Those words are nowhere in the four canonical gospels. In fact, they're not in any gospel. Where did Paul hear them from? So there is clearly this oral teaching. You know, St. Paul talks about after his conversion, spending three years in Arabia under the tutelage of teachers who must have already been taught this stuff so they could teach him. Right. And then he went and met the apostles in, in uh, Jerusalem and laid before them what he was about to go out and do. And they said, fine, that sounds good to us. Right. Just remember the poor, you know, the very thing of which he wanted to do. So the idea that we're going to find all of this in the scriptures goes against the scriptures themselves. And clearly, what took place during all that time? Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, some 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 one might say, um, you know, might have different audiences listening, uh, considering the faith. One might say, well, how could someone organize or or a church organize these things? What's the importance of that organization? If you could touch on uh, uh, the 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 Lord saying that the the, the gates of hell should never prevail against my church, and well, if you could also yeah. touch on the Jerusalem Council and how that structure plays out and and why it's important? That's a very good question. And I think one of the things we have to remember is that for as stunned as Satan and the demons were on the day of Pascha, on on the day of the Lord's resurrection, something they didn't anticipate, uh, they got to work right after that. And they started figuring out, okay, what can we do to mess this all up? And from the very beginning, you had people trying to pervert the gospel message. You had the Gnostics, and then, you know, for ever since we, we've not stopped having perversions of the gospel. And the, the order, the, the apostolically ordained order that each community was to have was so that precisely the community could be led by people 
primarily a bishop, okay. who would have this apostolic knowledge and who had received the apostolic deposit of faith. And so the people, as assured in Paul's letters and elsewhere, would know that from this person who derived right. his authority from someone who derived his authority from someone who derived it from an apostle themselves, right. was to be trusted with the message that they were preaching and teaching and sharing and, and all of that kind of thing, that you couldn't trust these other people, but you could trust this guy because he got it from known, trusted sources. And so the, 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 the authority invested in the bishop also was reflected the way the entire church community was structured with elders and with uh, catechumenates that lasted in some cases a long time. You know, some people say three years. It wasn't always three years, but yeah, for a period of time it was. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of this was done in such a way so that, as St. Paul said in one of his epistles, let all things be done properly in good order. You know, by the way, almost all of Paul's epistles are dealing with good order of one sense or another. Mm. You know, he wrote his epistles not to necessarily explain theology, but I, I love this meme that I've seen on Facebook where if St. Paul wrote an epistle today from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to, to the brethren who are at whatever, I don't even know where to begin with you guys, you know, and it just goes <laughs> on from there. I, 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 that's what he was trying to, to, to prevent from happening with his epistles. Most of his epistles deal with order, the good order of the churches, you know. Uh, this guy sleeping with his stepmother, get rid of him until he repents, you know, and, and things like that. Listen to the, your, your overseers and then things like that. So it was, it was to ensure that the message could be safeguarded and guaranteed by the structure of the church that had been, in, that had been set up and established by the apostles. Yeah. So, uh, just, just, to, just to break it down, it sounds like the church is a, a safeguard, so to speak. Uh, um, from other, from from outside uh, influences, uh, evils, so to speak, uh, uh, alterations, and those things. Uh, for those of you who might not be Orthodox, this is uh, a very similar structure to obviously where the Orthodox Church is today. A lot of the councils weren't convened um, just out of thin air, but they convened in a response mm -hmm. to a, a local issue to address. Uh, um, so to speak, heresies, things that were going wrong in the yeah. church and to keep everything in order, as you say. So just to tie in what you're saying, Father. Yeah, it, this is one thing we were taught in seminary about canons, for example, is a canon was never written for the hell of it. A canon was written, and you can usually figure out why they were written because you look at what they say. You know, for example, when you have canons that say a presbyter should not go to the circus or a presbyter should not be caught at the theater, well, then yeah. we're talking about Ringling Brothers. The circus back then, the Circus Maximus, or any circus, was a place where there were chariot races in which there was carnage and death and all kinds of things like that. What does a man of God have to be doing there for? Or the theater, which was very, uh, very body, B-A-W-D-Y, very body, very uh, pornographic in, in many ways, very, yeah. very carnal. A priest right. should not be at a place like that. So these things were written because they were taking place and because order had to be restored and had order had to be clarified so that people would know what and was not expected of them as Christians. Yeah, right. So things that are happen outside of the Bible, Father, but line up with the scriptures, but uh, are... are they're just a, an extension of the authority given to the apostles and their successors through Christ. Absolutely. And, and, and the apostolic fathers talk about that. They talk about the authority, you know, invested in them and things like that. And even go so far as to say, as Ignatius did, that the, the bishops surrounded by the presbyters and deacons and the people, that picture is the church right there. The bishops, yeah. the, the apostle, the successor to the apostles, surrounded by his people, mm -hmm. constituting the church of that area, that was the image of the church. And that's wow. been our image ever since. Yeah, it really touched me. A uh, quick story, and, and we'll kind of kind of close from here. It really touched me when I first became Orthodox Christian. I had a uh, Orthodox priest say um, he he showed me a picture of who his last successor was on his church wall, who the bishop was, and those things. And he mentioned to me, he says, "I can point back to you through ordination, my line all the way back to an apostle," and um, it 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 really was like wow. You know, at first, it's really unbelievable in, in yeah. some way. 
but it, it, it's there's something to it about order. Obviously, we're dealing with humans, um, but uh, the church that Christ established is still here. Glory to God. Glory to God. Uh, Amen. Father, just to just to kind of wrap uh, wrap close what we what we already uh, talked about in the first part. Um, you obviously mentioned your story of why apologetics became important to you, and as Orthodox Christians or even people who are in a and uh, uh, in, in a in considering the church or whether outside the church, and they're saying, well, you know, the Orthodox Church doesn't have anything. They don't, you know, they don't uh, talk about it. They don't come out and you know defend their faith well. Why is it important for someone to do so? What what and how should we approach it and those things? Well, I think in today's day and age, mm -hmm. the ability and the, the knowledge clergy have, forget clergy, just lay people in general, the, the level at which they can engage in, and I'm not going to call it debate or argumentation because I don't like that, the level at which they can engage in dialogue or discussion about the faith is as, as high as probably it has been ever since a thousand years ago. Um, right. the Orthodox in the Orthodox Church, clergy have uh, have always been very educated, very mm -hmm. educated, but so mm -hmm. were the laity. People mm -hmm. talk about the dark ages in the West where people couldn't read. That was not us. That was not our lay people and things like that. That may have happened after the uh, the Turks took over, but it wasn't our history. We were a very educated church with a very educated people. And I think it, it you can find today in, in in almost every church, not only a clergyman, a priest, but you can find people who are extremely knowledgeable about the faith. Why? Because most of them were not born Orthodox. They are converts who came into the church deliberately, who studied deliberately, who read extensively, who weighed mm -hmm. and evaluated everything that they knew and made a decision to come home to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So while, while the criticism could be made in the past, and even I would make it because I witnessed it myself growing up, it can't be made now. If people are looking for an answer, if they'd like to talk to someone in an Orthodox church, go to the nearest Orthodox church, and the the the, the priest you're going to meet, the deacon you're going to meet, the, the, some of the lay people you'll, you'll meet, will be among the most educated you've met in any church, Orthodox or non-Orthodox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, of course, glory to God for that, Father. Um, I thank you for coming on. And just want to give a last uh, uh, second chance for you to um, um, tell tell us where we can find you, any events coming up that, you know, somebody might be in the area for, um, and how to get in touch with you if they have any questions, if they're, some of the questions you brought up interested them. Well, uh, we have a Facebook page for St. John the Theologian Orthodox Church in, in Shirley, New York. Yes, Shirley, New York. Uh, on Long Island. And um, we do have some stuff coming up. Anybody in the New York area uh, listening to this uh, podcast uh, should mark on their calendar uh, Friday night, April 1st and Saturday, April 2nd. We're going to have Dr. Eugenia Constantinou uh, come out from California to give a weekend retreat on her book, Thinking Orthodox, uh, one of the literally uh, a legitimate bestseller in the Orthodox world nowadays. It's It's, it's been uh, extensively bought and is being extensively read all across the country. It's a wonderful book and a very much needed one. And I'm glad she wrote it. So we're going to have her out uh, the first weekend in April during Lent. Yes, glory to God. And every, anybody who knows Dr. Janine, um, she is a, a, a so, sort of speak, a thoroughbred for the faith, if you will. She is uh, 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 such a a, a thorough and deep, deeply thought out um, uh, theologian, if you will, for our faith. Yes. And yes. she is, she is brought out many great things that uh, has even have blessed my life. Um, Father, is there anything else this week that somebody um, in maybe, uh, you know, that might be uh, attached to the urban apologetics world um, that they that they might see you on? Is there something they could tune into and see, you know, have a, a discussion with a non-Orthodox? Well, uh, there, there is one coming up on Friday, on uh, this coming Friday, which is April uh, 4th. I'm going to be on a podcast with a fellow that a number of people have heard of named Vocab Malone. Yep. So I was on Vocab's podcast back in August. I think it was August 15th, middle of the month. 
And um, uh, we had a, a, a very good talk. And I'm, I'm very happy to say one of the reasons he invited me on is because he was complaining he had not met any respectful Orthodox Christians. OK, be that as it may, I the word somehow got back to him. If you want to talk to someone who will engage you in polite conversation, talk to Father Jonathan. And so uh, thanks to Vocab, I was on his show back in August and he invited me back for this Friday, and we're going to be talking about what, I'm not sure, but it's going to be very interesting nevertheless. And I I, I think anybody who tunes in uh, is going to be very pleased with the outcome. Well, Father, well, thank you. I appreciate all the work that you're doing in this field. Um, continue on, and, and glory, glory to God for you. Um, and, and once again, we're just we're thankful for you and everyone. Anybody who's listening, um, I will try to have the links of some of the scriptural uh, links in there in the in in, in the bio, um, so you can refer to what he's talking about and, and get the actual inference there. Um, glory to God and uh, bless you all. Thank you for listening. Bless you. Thank you.